Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another Archives Live series. Uh, we're back for another few weeks, and uh, we're very happy to welcome Ian Stair to our uh, broadcast. We're going to talk about some of new music that he's just put out, some old music, which he plays. Um, we'll take a look at his studio and like that. So welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you for coming on board. Hi. Hi, everybody. So I just want to mention that um, I met Ian, like many people that are now in the ARP family that I, or what I consider the ARP family, um, online. He's always been a great supporter of the Alan R. Perlman Foundation since I can remember. I think we started chit-chatting last October prior to when we did our first fundraiser. And you were just like right there with us all the way. And then we got to meet in person at NAM, which was, was pretty brilliant, except that it was such a big blur that I, I remember I emailed you later, like, did you ever get a t-shirt? How did that work out? Oh my gosh. <laughs> so, um, so probably I met a lot of you too at NAM, and I don't remember because it was a big blur. But uh, we've, uh, we talk a lot and it's been a real pleasure. He's been very inspirational and supportive since the pandemic has started and uh, I really enjoy his post. You did a lot of uh, wonderful live presentations. Um, one of the ones that sticks out in my mind was when you were playing the uh, just the synth part of one of the Pretty Hate Machine songs. Do you remember? Um, I don't know. remember when you did that. But... Yeah, I do a bunch of those where it's just like a quick little, you know, clip kind of thing of just like sound design demonstrations and, uh, you know, just like to kind of keep it, you know, easily digestible. I'll do like, you know, like little quick, you know, Facebook live things where I'll just go through. Uh, sometimes I'll do things where I, I, uh, I dissect the track and, you know, I'll, I'll mute out some of the things and be like, all right, here's, you know, here's how that sound sounds isolated by itself. And then here's how it sounds in context of the entire mix altogether. I really enjoyed the minimalism of this. And we'll get back to that because I, I, I started to form my own theories about some of your later music. I don't know if it had anything to do with that. But um, speaking of later music, I'd like to go back in time a little bit. And I'd like you to tell us a little bit about your um, musical history. How did you get from point A to uh, Pretty Hate Machine and now to your new CD. All right. Sherman set the way back machine to <laughs> about, I guess, probably around like 1988 or 1989. Um, I first got into playing music in general. Uh, I got a guitar as a uh, an eighth grade graduation gift from Aww. my mom. And... Um, you know, at the time I was into, I was into playing like metal music and things like that. But I had always like when I'd go to the library as a kid, um, I would check out, you know, like they had tapes that you could get from the library and I would get stuff like the art of noise and, um, you know, things like that, uh, you know, very synthesizer centric things. And I always liked that kind of music. And then, you know, as, you know, 89, 90 started to happen, I started to get into um, more of the intersection of electronic and like heavy metal, you know, so like uh, Nine Inch Nails, Ministry, Frontline Assembly, uh, Fear Factory, Nail Bomb, stuff like that. Um, and if you listen to what I'm making right now, you still don't get a, po a, a an idea of point A to point B because yeah. you're like, wait, you sound like Tangerine Dream now. How did you get there? <laughs> but um, so that, that kind of uh, developed in a sort of organic way and led, you know, f uh, being into that stuff started to kind of open my eyes to some of the, you know, what you could call the, the early uh, electronic, electronic pioneers of you know, industrial music like um, Chris and Cosey, um, Throbbing Gristle, Coil, stuff like mm -hmm. that. And then that led into being into all right, now I'm going to check out some of the people these folks were, in, you know, uh, inspired by. So like Stockhausen, um, uh, you know, and, and those types of folks, um, you know, uh, Gilly of Derbyshire, you know, things like that. And it just started to kind of go down this rabbit hole. And then, you know, uh, things just kind of developed in an organic way. I got distracted by rave culture, you know, in the, in the middle of the late nineties and got into 
electronic music production in that realm. But by that token, I also got interested in, you know, okay, Juan Atkins, Derek May, Richie Houghton, you know, uh, electronic producers like that, and then getting into what influenced them, like Kraftwerk and things like that. So it all kind of was this big exploratory sort of uh, journey of learning and all of that stuff. I don't want to go too deep into the into the hows and whys and wheres because it'll take the entire hour to, 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 to roadmap all that out to how we got here today. Um, but that's kind of like a really quick summation of, um, of, you know, kind of what inspired me to get into all this in the first place. Mm -hmm. That's great. I mean, I saw Nine Inch Nails with the first Lollapalooza. That was, that was, uh, yeah, I, that was an amazing, amazing experience. And I was completely and totally blown away. And I didn't know what to call it at the time myself. I was very into punk and, uh, when punk first came out and, uh, there was a headbanging quality that I really enjoyed that they carried forth, but it was definitely not punk. So I, you know, I didn't, sure. you know, and I, and I'm, and I really hate to start to categorize things. And I think in your exploration, you must see that it's, it's sort of one, all one big soup and in what, different things kind of come bubbling out. That's, that's what I think anyway. Um, so uh, when, when did pretty hate machine come around? How did that, Okay, so to contextualize how that started, I need to back up to about, let's say, 2008 or 2009. Um, I had just come out of working as a, like a national level, or at least regional level, but corporate employee at Guitar Center. I was a regional product specialist and technology manager, um, and my territory at the time when I left the company um, was from New Jersey up the Eastern seaboard to Maine. And when I left, I decided, well, you know, I'm very interested in live event production, uh, especially the visual aspect of it. I was, I was already doing work as a front of house engineer, but I also, I, every, every time I would do a show as a front of house audio engineer, I would look over at the lighting guy or gal and be like, man, they're, they're having a lot of fun. Mm -hmm. um, so I started to really get into lighting and that kind of dovetails in with my experience. Like I said, I got distracted by rave culture. Um, in, in the mid to late nineties, I was doing a lot of DJing. And when I would get done doing my DJ gig, um, I would still be at the club because a lot of times we were the production company putting on the event and we'd have to wait until the thing was over right. to you know get our gear Break and load back and take stuff. it out. Yeah. Exactly. Okay. So I would take two steps to the left and play with the club's you know lighting controller. And so I kind of started to understand and appreciate and enjoy playing with lights and things like that. So I got into that whole thing very early on from the technical aspect of it, from, you know, uh, computerized lighting, not so much theatrical, but more in the, um, the, the, the very technology heavy aspect of it. So fast forward to 2008, 2009, um, I got a job working at a, uh, fairly well-established local lighting production shop here in Philadelphia. And I started to really do that full time. And then a lot of the experience I developed from there, um, just you know, building up my resume and you know, starting to go from doing theater shows to arena shows to you know things like that, um, sort of led naturally to me getting a call to um, go and start doing some touring. And I, uh, you know, went out and I toured with a couple of bands. Um, I toured with Atari Teenage Riot um, from Berlin, uh, and eventually I got a call to go do a, a really awesome uh, multi-band summer festival package called Under the Sun, where I was the lighting director for a bunch of you know top 40 uh, 90s bands like uh, Smash Mouth, Sugar Ray, Gin Blossoms, Blues Traveler, Better Than Ezra, E6, Vertical Horizon. Wow. If, if you go to the grocery store and you go to buy a bottle of milk, you're <laughs> probably going to hear their songs, their, their household right. names, right? right? right. So... Um, years after that, you know, uh, fast forward to around, I guess, 2018 or so, I got a call from my friend, Brandon, who was previously the tour manager for Smash Mouth. And he had gotten off the road. Uh, he had just had, uh, two children and he got a, a, 
a, a closer to home sort of gig still in the industry, but he does like artist management and things like that. And he had reached out to me because he had the idea uh, that he wanted to get back into playing music. He's a drummer. And he thought to himself, well, I don't want to do an original act because that takes a lot of work with just, you know, songwriting and rehearsal and promotion and all that sort of thing. But maybe doing a tribute band would be a lot of fun because he already does a lot of work as a booking agent, booking tribute bands and things like that. So it seemed like it was a, it was a good idea. But then he started to think about, all right, um, you know, what band would I want to do a tribute of? What really excites me? What's interesting? And so he thought. Oh, man, I'd really like to do Nine Inch Nails. The challenge with that is that is a it's a pretty tall bar. You know, you're talking yeah. about a band that has a 30 year history with you know Grammy wins, Oscar wins, Golden Globes, things like that, and are regarded by some as this sort of you know golden standard of electronic music. You know, mm-hmm. when you try to contextualize, oh, what sort of music do you make? And if you're into industrial or or you know hard electronic music probably the the one touchstone that most people have is you know my friend matt from the band caustic has a t-shirt that literally says yeah like nine inch nails sure (laughs) you know um you know so it's kind of this household name that a lot of people know and so there's this really high standard of um you know verisimilitude that you have to kind of hit otherwise it just it just sounds really poorly executed and so he says, do you think you're up to that? And I'm like, eh, okay. You know, I think I could actually, you know. And so I did a couple of tests. Uh, I, I did a few clone tracks to see if I could get the sound design close. Um, I found through the magic of the internet, I found a few isolated multi-tracks to work off of to kind of use as A-B comparisons for the sound design. And when I got it all together and, and recorded it into Pro Tools and put the fingers up and, and mixed it, Wow. Well, out of my speakers sounded like Nine Inch Nails. And so we kind of moved forward with it. And um, we, it was really funny. Uh, I'll try to land the plane really quickly. Um, but we, we did some remote rehearsal. You know, in other words, we would, uh, you know, I would send them backing tracks. You know, I would do a fully orchestrated backing track where I had the drums and the guitar parts temped in. And then what the plan was, was to take those individual multi-tracks and then mute what we didn't need for, for live performance. And so I sent them over those, those backing multi-tracks and the guitar players rehearsed to it and the drummers rehearsed to it and the singer, you know, rehearsed to it. But the first time we had ever actually been in the same room. Yeah, that's so weird. <laughs> was, was, was the day of our first show. Wow. Which was, which was to a sold out crowd of 2,200 people at the Fillmore in Charlotte, North Carolina back in August of last year. So no pressure, you know, but that, but the good thing is everybody in the band, you know, there's me, there's Brandon who has touring experience and all the other musicians in the band are all professional musicians that have established original acts. So it's no one's first rodeo. And so we literally were able to just bang through one one run through of the set list with our monitor engineer to get our in-ear mix you know dialed up and then we just went back and touched on a couple of notes that we had from rehearsal and then it was like okay strike the gear let's go back to the dressing room and get ready for the show and then it was go time and uh actually the 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 clip i sent you is actually from that show from that show Uh, so this is your first live in person experience all right. First Let, time we ever played together. Let's play this. Okay. All right. Sure.
Are we back? We're back. Hi. Hi. Wow. I, 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 that puts a whole spin. You didn't tell me that was your first in-person gig when you gave that to me, so I'm duly impressed. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, well, I, I it, it was I a big job. You know, it was definitely a big job to, to kind of, you know, reach up and go, all right, I think I can hit that bar. Let's let's jump. Let's yeah. see if we can hit it. You know, well, and the crowd looks like they feel like you hit it, too. So, yeah, yeah. What a great feeling to perform in front of a crowd like that. Yeah. You must be missing that. It's been a bit of a drag uh, because, you know, we, we did that show. We did another one uh, a couple months after it. And then we had uh, another show that we played in February uh, this year. And obviously, you know, very quickly after February, everything just kind of globally in the music industry just went. <laughs> um, but we had, you know, we had a lot of offers coming in to play shows and we kind of had a, a sort of a roadmap for what we were going to be doing. And we, um, you know, we had merch made up the whole nine, you know, we, we are we're, we're kind of slotted and ready to get back to it as soon as things open up and in, in a way that we can do it safely. Um, but right now, clearly, you know, no one is playing shows anywhere. Right. So, so, uh, you've been doing some creative stuff though. Um, what have you, been, uh, tell us about what you've been doing and what led to, um, your new CD. So in and amongst all of this, um, I have a sort of Berlin school inspired ambient um, electronic music project, uh, you know, which is just titled Stare, you know, which is my last name with the stylized, you know, Delta in the middle. And I've had a, a very uh, humblingly good amount of success with that. Um, I've gotten some FM radio airplay and I've played a few uh, fairly well regarded, uh, curated electronic festivals, uh, as that, um, as that incarnation of myself and, you know, I've released a few CDs there that have thankfully, you know, very, I'm very grateful for the fact that, you know, those, those editions sold out and, uh, that's, that's kind of something to kind of go wow about, you know, in this era of, uh, oh, no one buys music anymore. Uh, it's I've been very, very thankful for that, especially with something as sort of niche as as ambient and uh, you know pure electronic music as opposed to you know more pop oriented EDM or anything like that, which I do enjoy myself, um, but that's not what this is. And so um, I did uh, in April of this year. I did a a free release on my Bandcamp for that project. Um, I just kind of gave it away just as a, as a kind of a, a gesture for folks who were, you know, kind of stuck at home with nothing to do and looking for some, maybe some new music to listen to and uh, sort of things like that. But um, as the whole quarantine process sort of drug on as it still manages to drag on, yeah. um, you know, I'm, I, I stopped counting the, the days and weeks. I used to know exactly what week we were in. Yes, this is week number 13 of, of quarantine. Now I don't even know. I'm, I'm hardly aware of what day it is. <laughs> um, but um, I started to kind of um, dig out some gear. And as you can see, I've got, you know, a, a decent amount to play around with. Um, I started to kind of just do some things in the, in the times that I would spend just kind of doing deep dives into the different instruments that I have and just playing around with um, different things. And I started to kind of explore compositional and sound design techniques that weren't quite on brand for the ambient Berlin School project, um, but were perhaps more informed by the things that I was doing in the sound design for Pretty Hate Machine. You know, I've got a lot of the gear that was used to do those records, you know, like I've got, you know, when we play live, I've got an actual Yamaha DX7 because that's what they used on stage. Uh, and it's triggering sounds from a rack full of emu samplers because mm -hmm. that's what they used on stage. Um, so the, the sound design experiments that I got into doing that just sort of began to have this sort of, you know, darker, grittier, um, 
you know, somewhat less polished sort of sound to them. They, they still sounded like me, um, but they sounded um, a little bit different from what I could write and record under the, the Stayer um, umbrella. So it came together pretty quickly. And um, within, you know, a couple of days of deciding, all right, you know, I, I've done enough work here that I want to hit save, you know what I mean? And I want to start kind of collating these ideas into an idea book and uh, starting to kind of piece them together into compositions. Um, you know, I, I started to realize, all right, I've got enough for a release here. Mm -hmm. Let's start to kind of polish it. And that that's kind of that's kind of what ended up driving the whole thing forward was just the idea of, all right, you know what, I think I've got something completely different but viable. Yeah, I know that the length of the songs are more what we think of as, uh, I don't even want to say performance-oriented songs because that's not true either, but they're shorter. They're much shorter than um, the stare, the, 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 other, the, uh, the Berlin School. Yeah, they're um, the easiest adjective I could use to describe them is more digestible. Um, you know, like uh, I do have my stuff up on you know Spotify and iTunes and Apple Music and you know all the all the prerequisite platforms mm -hmm. for that. But you know, when it's twenty minutes long, there's there's obviously a dedicated audience that is, um, you know, they're accustomed to you know things like you know Klaus Schulze and Tangerine Dream and um, you know, all, all of the, the music that lives in that sphere tends to take its, its, its sweet time right. and it's, it's not rushed and it's, you know, it's, it's designed to inspire contemplation and, and deep listening. But, um, you know, sometimes it doesn't need to be that long. You know, if you look at the work, uh, I started to be more inspired in a way by listening to the soundtrack and scoring work that, that people I'm into uh, mm. were doing, you know, Charlie Clouser uh, with his work on the Saw series and, um, you know, some of the shorter things that, you know, Hans Zimmer and uh, Benjamin Wallfish did for the Blade Runner 2049 score and things uh, like beautiful. that, yeah. that, you know, were, you know, impactful, but didn't need to be necessarily, you know, these 20 minute long or 12 minute long epics. I love the 20 minute long epics, but um, I felt that it was almost like a challenge to myself to say, Hey, can you compose something that gets to the point? Unlike the way I speak, <laughs> um, you know, gets to the point and, and delivers a complete arc within the space of, let's say three minutes, you know, and, uh, and I feel like this release was able to do that. So I would like to play uh, for everyone, um, it's Towards Equilibrium, um, I believe that's, yep, yeah. um, and uh, uh, hopefully we could talk a little bit about that as well afterwards. Um, so we're going to play this from start to finish, uh, forgive everyone for my amateur video interpretations, but, um, and I have a lot of questions about the artwork actually. Uh, so a lot of this artwork is based on the artwork that is part of the CD, which is very compelling. All right, let's see if I can get this right. Here we go.
get that there we go really beautiful yeah that i think that that's become my favorite um maybe the plaintive piano in the beginning something about that resonates a lot with me and it, it I, I could I could feel it being um, influenced by soundtracks in a way where there's a there's a sort of a poignant loneliness to in the beginning and then it it sort of gathers uh, hope somewhat towards it's an interesting this is my interpretation um, so tell me tell me tell me um, is the process that thought out is it is it uh, does it come first and then the feelings come later? How does your process work? It's driven from a couple of different vectors. Um, a lot of times what will end up happening is I'll be just working with a particular sound and that sound will suggest um, a melody. You know, like a lot of times when I'll be working with my modular synthesizer, I'll patch something up and run it through some effects and kind of just kind of develop a, a sort of a, a bed, you know what I mean, to establish a landscape. And then I'll kind of just sit there and listen to it for a little while and maybe some overtone uh, series will, will kind of pop out of it and they may suggest, uh, you know, a key or um, you know, like um, harmonic motion or something like that. So um, with this, it was kind of on some of the tracks on the EP, it was driven by that sound design process, you know, saying, all right, we're going to build it up from the bedrock on up and start to, you know, add layers on. And then as the layers build, it starts to start to steer itself in one way or another. There's a lot of improvisation that happens. I'll just leave, you know, I'll, I'll leave a part running uh, or cycling or whatever, like I'll set it and, and let it loop or whatever like that and just do a lot of improvisation over it until something kind of jumps up and goes, you know, and I go, what was that? You know, and then I try to, you know, you know replay it and then, you know, smack the record button and start to lay it down. Uh, for that particular piece, um, that was, that was, that started with the piano part. It started out with the first um, melodic figure that kind of shows up. It's just the bam, 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 you know, thing, which, kind of evolved out of a set of rules I set for myself um, in the composition process was that if there was melody involved to try to not force it, you know, um, mm -hmm. to kind of just develop um, quick but useful um, melody and harmony and then just put it, put it in, you know what I mean? Hit record and get it down. And then, in the course, you know, as you hear that song sort of go along, you hear some counterpoints kind of come in and some things that fill in the gaps. Um, and that that's kind of the, the way that that one sort of fell together. And there's a few on the EP that that, that do that, where it, it starts out very much as, you know, it started out primarily a lot of it, melodically speaking, not sound design speaking, but melodically, uh, they, they began as as piano, and that's something that's sort of common to most of my stuff, uh, with the exception of with my Stayer project, I did a long form single. You know, it was a single track, but it was twenty minutes long, called "The Garden of Forking Paths." Mm -hmm. um, that one was entirely synthetic. You know, that one started when I got my when I got my Juno one hundred six back from a um, a restoration by uh, Allison Stout at Belltone Synthworks in Philadelphia. Um, I got that back and I was so stoked to have it back that I started, you know, playing some, some, um, some chords and melody on it. And I was like, okay, this could use like a little bit of a, a you know, a sequenced sort of, you know, again, tangerine dream kind of Klaus Schultz, uh, Ber Berlin school thing going. So I set that up and that kind of just went boom straight to the finish line. And then the next thing, you know, I was hitting record and I had a, a 20 minute piece done that was like, I got to get this out right now. And I put together the artwork, sent it to my mastering engineer. And I think in about, you know, uh, in about a week, it was you know ready to go out. And then that was, you know, send it off to disc makers, get it duplicated. And, uh, you know, the rest is history on that one. It's sold out. But um, 
aside from a few of those, even if you look at my my live CD that I did, Telemetry, which is a compilation of uh, live to air performances that I did on WXPN uh, in Philadelphia and WPRB in Princeton, um, those were uh, those were compiled together from live performances that I did, which definitely incorporated piano into them. And that's always one of the things that I've tried to kind of strike a balance with is having you know all of the synthesizers doing the you know the the very um bespoke textures you know things that are not something that you can just point out and go oh yeah that's a or you know how the heck do you even write that down in you know how do you notate that how would i copyright that you know there, it's just there, there's maybe an overtone in there but you know there's yeah. there's not much to go on as far as okay how do you play this on piano that stuff but then there is also I try to have it so that way there's a melody in there. And that's something that is like when I say this project sounds like the other one, but it's different. Um, that's, I think, where they, the Venn diagram kind of meets is the fact that this does also have a good amount of um, that. You know, there's piano, there's cello, there's harp. Um, in some of the other mixes I've done for other people, I've done stuff as ostentatious as including French horn, you know, uh, and oh, flute. No, no, you know? I... like it's like that. But that again, that that pulls back to having, you know, been influenced by, you know, the greats, the Klaus Schultzes of the world, the Tangerine Dreams, and Art of Noise. You know, the the things that they did where they incorporated these orchestral elements into. Um, things that were very much of a of a electronic mechanical synthetic nature and i and i like that i mean there was a, there was a big movement i remember when synthesizers were just beginning to be uh you know more standard uh instruments for for bands and there was this uh fear amongst musicians that it was going to replace uh their oboe, their flute, their, uh, you know, their strings. Their th and, uh, the pre you know, the, the instruments with the presets where they had, you know, like the soloist, where they had, you know, certain sounds. But what I found is that it's a supporting sound in some ways. In other ways, it's its own unique sound. That when you play electronic music, and aren't trying to make it sound like something other than electronic music. Uh, that works. And then as, it, as an added element with classical music, why not? Um, you know, why not? I, I, I found a classical element to the beginning of the piano. I think that's one of the things that actually resonated with me. And again, I think we look at this music as a big soup and different, you know, there's different ingredients that we put in and different ingredients that we favor. That, sure. Uh, you know, it's a I mean, positive experience. Look at Wendy Carlos. You know, Wendy okay. took you know classical music and recontextualized it in, an, in a sort of electronic, um, you know, uh, delivery format and blew up the entire thing. You know, and said, "Wow, this is this is what you know the synthesizer can do. It's not it's not just you know Mort Sabotnik. Um, it's not just West Coast." Um, and I've got nothing bad to say about that. I mean, I love, you know, Krell patches and, you know, uh, West Coast generative things and, you know, the Forbidden Planet soundtrack and stuff that just sounds absolutely mental, right? But there's also, you know, the, the, you can do things that do have a more melodic component to them, but don't necessarily have to have, I love the word verisimilitude, um, to a extant instrument it doesn't have to sound precisely like exactly. a piano it doesn't have to sound precisely like an oboe uh you know oboe arp 2500 you know <laughs> uh you know from close encounters you know it sounds like an oboe um but you know it's you know it's you know the sound waves are similar yeah that, that's it but um so uh iterative processes um I, I love that on a language level i love i love language i love exploring language and uh the idea of iterations is something that I actually, my own artwork, I, I do. So I, it really resonated with me. Speaking of artwork, tell me about the artwork. It looks like, it looks very biological, microbiological, DNA strands. Tell me about the, the artwork itself. Is well, um, 
that that's that's the point. Uh, when I began doing the you know the first couple of demos for the record, um, obviously, as the things started to gel and fall into place, I personally the way the way my brain works, I can't help but to start sort of picturing. You know, it's almost like I'm scoring in my head on a on a scoring stage. You know, with a you know seventy foot wide um, you know, film projector in front of me, but you know, the, the picture is coming from my head and, you know, some of the things that I started to kind of picture in my head was, okay, this sounds sort of like, you know, obviously everything in this particular bit of sound is synthetic, but it, it it's reminiscent of, you know, a, a dark cave with some water dripping or the weird faraway echoes that you hear in a subway tunnel at, you know, three o'clock in the morning when you're waiting for the path to get from Manhattan to Jersey City or something like that. Um, or it sounds, even though it's it's not that, it sounds like an idling diesel engine or, um, you know, there there's things that have a, a sort of, you know, um, you know, organic quality to them or uh, a familiarity to them. So when I started to try to figure out what the visual language of the release would be, which is something that I'm kind of big into, if you look at my stayer releases, for the most part, they all try to sort of stick to this design Bible where they all have a, a commonality of color palettes and, and typefaces and subject matter. Um, I, I like to do that also with this project. And that comes from being a fan of bands that have just had that sort of artistic aspect to them. Um, you know, where you could look at a record, you know, to kind of jump in a bunch of different ways. You know, you can look at an Iron Maiden album cover and go, that's Iron Maiden. You don't even okay. need to see the logo. You could see the artwork and you're like, that's Iron Maiden. Or you could look at, uh, you know, a band like... Um, Carbon-based life one. Carbon-based life forms. Yeah, exactly. You know, they've got a very specific typeface that they use. They've got a very specific type of photo, uh, you know, uh, photographic and compositional elements that they use. Um, solar fields, same thing. Um, a lot of those record labels, 4AD records. Okay, mm -hmm. uh, if you look oh, at the stuff that 4AD did, you look at their their entire record label. And you look at the releases there, Network Records as well, um, in, in the late 80s, you know, Skinny Puppy Manufacturer, um, Sarah McLaughlin even, you know, they had this sort of visual branding going on. So as I started to kind of stick things up on the proverbial, uh, you know, Pinterest board for, you know, what this, uh, what the design Bible would look like for, um, I started to pick out elements and say, all right, you know, let's use elements of um, fabric, you know, which... Oddly enough, if you look at the the acoustic panels that are hanging on the wall behind me, I built oh, them okay. myself, and uh, you know they're Owens Cording 703, uh, you know mineral fiber wrapped with black burlap, and so it's something I subconsciously see every day when I'm in here working. You know, it's, it's your environment, right? Um, but then also things like, you know, there's rusted metal, there's um, uh, soil, you know, eroding soil, there's um, things like, um, you know, decomposing fruit, um, things like that. And, you know, then the DNA strand that sort of has this ribbon kind of thing going through it. And when I designed the artwork, you know, um, you know, the idea of the title iterated processes, um, you know, was to kind of showcase that, you know, if you listen to the, the sound design in the release, there's, there's, there's some things that show up sort of in the same way in different keys, you know, things are played in different keys and, you know, but some of the same, some of the same tricks show up, you know, in multiple ways. And some of these songs even started as one song and then I had a part and I was like, you know what, that part doesn't fit in here, but Hey, let's start a new file. Let's, let's move that part over here and then build something new up around that. Yeah. But it was the idea that there are these different components that you can take and assemble in different ways and and so I decided to try to reflect that also in the art design, you know, where if you look at like the stuff that you, you had playing during the slideshow, uh, you know, there the in in every one of the like when you buy the album on Bandcamp, right, there's there's an additional set of files that comes with it. That's, you know, the, the PDF of the album artwork. But there's also some high res printable art prints 
and each of those art prints, believe it or not, has all of the elements are in there. They're pushed backwards or forwards in Photoshop and their transparencies are adjusted and things have been rotated and, um, you know, made more or less obvious. But that's, that's really what the, you know, if you want to look inside the pot and see what the soup is made of, right. um, those, that's kind of what, what drove that, that, um, again, what, what, what were the big rocks in the jar for the design Bible? So the artwork is also different iterations of the same thing. Exactly. Yeah. It's a macrocosm. It's yeah. fractal. You know what I mean? The yeah. tiny things should reflect the structure of the whole. Um, so what instruments did you use um, in your new CD? Do you want to give us a little tour of your studio? I usually like to have audiences see sure. people's, Absolutely. people's um, creative juices. Yeah. 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 So uh, I'm going to kind of pen uh, my laptop over here, and we'll start over here to my right, mm -hmm. um, which is in this this rack here. Um, so in this rack down here, I've got going from the top to the bottom, I've got an access virus B, then a power conditioner. I've got uh, one Motu MIDI Express that handles some of the MIDI routing for the room. I've got a Novation A station. And I've got a Waldorf Micro Q. I've got an Emu Extreme Lead 1. Then uh, a Neutric Patch Bay, a Line Mixer, and then one of my uh, Motu 896 um, audio interfaces. Then I'm going to tip it back up and kind of pan this way. Then on this stand here, I've got a uh, Chord Poly 6, Oberheim Matrix 6, for which I also have the, the Stereo Ping uh, Matrix Programmer, which is a lifesaver with that. It, it keeps you from having to menu dive and, and hate your life. <laughs> um, then uh, Roland Juno 106. And then below here in a couple of road cases that are down here, I've got a sequential six track, a Korg Poly 800 Mark One, and... Uh, in the bottom case, I've got um, some stuff that I mainly use live, uh, which is a uh, Korg mini log. And I think there's something else in there, but I don't quite remember. Then over here behind me, I've got, you can see on the stand that's sort of set up, I've got a, at the bottom, there's a uh, Arbodice 2823, a legit 1978 um real odyssey then above that i've got the reissue uh korg arp odyssey and i got it in the uh, mark three color scheme because i'm from philly and you know go flyers black and orange plus i'm a big <laughs> fan of halloween so the pumpkin look you know black it just orange. like that it, it's 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 it speaks to me on many levels um but then i also have i'm just trying not to get my headphone cable cat tangled too much in here then I've got a Studio Logic Sledge 2.0 Black Edition, uh, which is again getting back to the Halloween color scheme. That's the cool one with the reversed uh, black on black keys with the Halloween orange knobs. And I've got a Novation Supernova 2, and sort of obscured, but on the bottom row of that A frame, I've got a Korg uh, Kronos X, which does a lot of heavy lifting. Uh, I, I use that that synthesizer a lot. And then in some road cases below that, I've got um, I've got an Ensonic ASR10, uh, which doesn't get used very much, but I used to use it as a, a live keyboard because I like the way the keys feel. And then uh, there's also a, a case down there that's got um, oh gosh, I forget what else is in there, but there's there's a couple of road cases that have some lesser used things in there. Then uh, in the back pivot this way modulars yeah uh i've got on the the rack in the back i've got the korg ms20 at the top i've actually got two of those i've got that one and then i actually i, I worked for korg um for a few years and i actually managed to um they were they were getting rid of some of their um some of their samples that they had at corporate and i managed to get serial number two of the uh, ms20 reissue which was nice. pretty dope um then in that rack, there's another Motu MIDI Express XT, which does the remainder of the MIDI routing for the room. Then uh, there's a Waldorf Microwave XT, 
It's the first edition with the uh, the Nextel knobs on it. Then there's a Korg WaveStation SR, an Emu E5000 Ultra sampler. There's an Oberheim Matrix 6R and a Ensonic MR rack, which is fundamentally it's the trans waves that were in the super rare uh, Ensonic Fismo, which no one can find, uh, just packaged into a extremely hostile uh, user interface. And that's not even my <laughs> work. That's, uh, Tom, Tom Ellard from Severed Heads has a blog, and he uh, he did a, re- a write up on the MR rack, saying it's fantastic, it's neat, but uh, do not get into using this instrument unless you are really uh, a bit of a masochist for, for UI. <laughs> then on the desk next to all that, uh, from the top down, I've got uh, 9U worth of Eurorack modular, and there's all sorts of stuff in there. There's uh, dope fur, there's tip-top audio, synthesis technology, uh, Moleco Heavy Industry, collaborations with Wired, uh, IntelliGel, Subconscious Communications, um, Pittsburgh Modular, WMD, Livewire, Harvest Man, uh, Division 6, uh, a bunch of different things in there. Um, and then next to that are two Korg SQ1 sequencers. And then I've got um, on the right side of the desk, there's a pedal board that has um, pedals from like Eventide, uh, Strymon, TC Electronic, things like that, and it's also got my uh, Roland um, TB303 reissue on it. Then on the desk, you can't really see it, but there's a Waldorf uh, StrikeFet string synthesizer over there, a little desktop box uh, to get those you know Berlin School spacey sounds, as well as a little Korg um, monolog, which I use as a, a tiny little compact keyboard controller and sequencer for most of the stuff up there. Then, uh, on leaning against the wall, uh, there's a Kurzweil uh, PC88 for when I really feel like uh, playing something that feels like a piano and has 88 keys. And then on the ground there uh, is a Sequential Pro 1. Um, it gets a lot of use, so it kind of goes on and off stands, but it doesn't quite have a permanent home yet because I'm, I'm sort of running out of space. <laughs> and then over here, finally, we'll dial into that wall which uh, that's the uh, digital synthesizer um, zoo. So on the top there, I've got uh, an Ensonic VFX SD. In the middle, t- uh, middle tier, there's a Korg uh, wave station. And then on the bottom, there's a uh, Ensonic TS-10. Those are all sort of like wavetable, um, transwave-based synthesizers. And then down there uh, in that Anvil-style road case, is my uh, my DX7, which is the one that I use live uh, with Pretty Hate Machine as my master controller. And I've also got a rack that I use uh, for Pretty Hate Machine that has an Emu uh, E4 XT Ultra sampler in it. That's what I, I use for sample triggering live. Wow. There's more. There's stuff in the closet. <laughs> but wait. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I mean, there's also, uh, gosh, I should probably spin this around just so you can see just just the tail of it. Um, uh, right there, yeah. you can see in the corner, there's a, uh, that's an ARP Selena string ensemble oh. um, that needs a little bit of love. It needs a little bit of work, but um, that's also something I'm very, very pleased and proud to have. Um, it just there's some stuff going on with the the effects section, which is you know a, a great portion of the character of that instrument. Of so course, yeah. I need need to get that working. So you um, you actually do tinker with some old machines, though. I remember seeing you uh, working on a old uh, Odyssey. I, I came upon a a video yeah. of you doing that. Yeah. So you do you, do you do your own repairs, or you send stuff to Allison, or? Uh, what I generally do is I, I love Allison. Um, she is an absolute treasure and a resource to the Philadelphia and I would, I should say probably the national, uh, electronic musician community. And what I try to do is I try to be respectful of her time. Um, so things that can be like first level, um, restoration and repair, I try to do myself. Like when I got that Odyssey, um, it had been given to me by a, a dear friend of mine named Jason, and it had been stored 
in a anvil case in which the uh, the foam inside the case oh, had deteriorated. Oh, I have, I know that that's happened to me. Too. And so the entire thing was coated mm. of black gunk. I mean, I have some <laughs> photos on my Facebook page of just this thing. It's a before and after, and there's black gunk with like pet hair stuck <laughs> in it, and it just looked. It was it was like tar. It was awful. Yeah. So I did that. I did the cleanup from that. Uh, I rebuilt the Pratt Reed key bed in it. So I took that all apart. I got bushings from synth chaser and, uh, he sent those up to me. And so I re-leveled, uh, the key bed and, uh, straightened all the J wire contacts and things like that. Took all the keys and put them in. Every time I get one of these vintage synthesizers, I immediately strip the key bed, put the keys in my bathtub with some dish soap <laughs> and just give them a bath and, you know, take some, uh, take some, some canned air where, where it's safe to do so. I'm not one of those fools that just sprays canned air everywhere and destroys ICs. Um, but you know, uh, you know, give it a good thorough cleaning. So that way I'm not bringing it to a shop, you know, with like bug eggs and nastiness in it and dust bunnies, the size of your fist. Um, but I try to get all of the, I try to get all of the obvious stuff done before I, I, uh, I, I waste Allison's time with it. Um, yeah. so that way, uh, she can get down to the nitty gritty because she's just, an incredible solder jockey. Uh, she's got a absolute depth and breadth of knowledge that she can just fire her off. She's always educated me every single time I've gone to her shop and she does great work and, uh, I wish her the best of success. But like I said, I don't want to unnecessarily weigh her and her staff down with things that are kind of below their pay grade as far as just, you know, cleaning keys and cleaning key contacts and stuff like that, that, yeah really any reasonably brave person with a screwdriver and a bottle of deoxid and some, you know, 90, 91% isopropyl can do themselves in their home. Uh, not, not, not in the time of COVID can't find that alcohol anymore, but anyway, <laughs> I, 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 had some. I had some and, uh, you know, I'm really glad that I, I had it because, uh, it, it's, it's been, it's been useful to have, but yeah. I've also got the same can of deoxid that I've had since probably 2003. <laughs> you know, you never use too much of that stuff. You can buy a whole can and it'll right. last you a lifetime. So, um, I wanted to, um, I wanted to open up to some questions cause we are getting very close to running out of time. Um, so, um, I'm going to, I'm going to definitely start off. I do have a question about the instruments you used on the CD, um, especially, uh, so you started off with the piano sound and then, um, it went on to other, as you say, uh, you can't quite pick them out sounds. Um, sure. I know that, I know that in one of the, at least one of the other tracks you used in Odyssey did. So what, uh, any predominant instruments that you used, um, on this CD? Yeah. Like I said, uh, the Kronos, uh, does a lot of heavy lifting. Um, when I first got into doing this sort of stuff, I was you know, kind of tied down to uh, a desktop working environment. I've, I've always been an all hardware person. I will say this. I'm not trying to say it to be a snob, but I'm just saying it because that's just the way my brain tends to work and the way that I feel most comfortable working is sitting in front of a piece of hardware with knobs and sliders and things. Even the graphics, you know what I mean, can be inspiring to me. Um, so... Um, I don't work like that anymore. When I moved into this new studio space, I have I have that machine that I used to use to do uh, you know MIDI sequencing and things like that. It's it's sitting right there on the floor, but I haven't hooked it up. You know what I mean? Um, mostly what I'm doing now is is using like you know controller keyboards to send MIDI messages from you know a a mass workstation out other things in the room, and then all, all the audio comes through a various. Uh, line mixers and patch bays to uh, you know audio interfaces throughout the room, and then that goes into Pro Tools, where I'll mix in Pro Tools, but I'm not doing the composition on you know a timeline like that, clicking with a mouse. I'm mostly sitting in front of an instrument. Yeah. Um, so the the Kronos did a lot of the heavy lifting on that, and that's also where a lot of the uh, more organic uh, instrumentation comes from. And there's a lot of power under the hood of that instrument i mean there you, you could look at it as going all right it's just another workstation like a motif or a phantom would be but under the hood it's really you know it's it's something like nine sound generation engines with a, a it's like having a whole rack of um effects it's got amp modeling cabinet modeling um you know, bit crushers wave folders 
phasers, flangers, multi-tap delays, convolution reverb, um, as well as a massive sound design uh, facility under the hood. So um, a lot of times from a sequencing perspective, um, I, I live in front of that or I'll, or I'll take it out of the stand here and set it up on a stand in the middle of the room and just kind of change my relationship to the situation. You know, I'll see what it feels like to play standing up. You know, I'll play piano parts even differently when I don't have the ability to like kind of stand on a pedal and do pedaling. I may actually with my fingers sustain the notes a little bit longer and just um, you know, articulation changes mm -hmm. when I'm doing that. Mm -hmm. um, but there was also stuff like um, the, the, the Waldorf uh, stuff shows up and the modular shows up. Um, the you know, there's there's things that get routed through the, the effects over on the pedal board. They show up. Um, you know, things from, you know, the Odyssey definitely shows up, you know, that that's like, it's a very prominent, um, element at the, the, the last section of the song of, of a nonlinear nature. Um, and then the, the studio logic sledge, um, they, they all kind of show up in one way or another, at least in the songwriting process. And they're in there. Uh, they may not make it to the final mix. Um, but you know, I, I definitely try to kind of walk around to everything. It's why everything is set up like this. It's all walk up and play. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, obviously I'm tied to my headphones and we're doing this broadcast here, but if I was to walk up to any of these, you know, they're all turned on, they're all making sound. I could smack keys on every single one in here and it'll, it'll sure. make a sound. Okay. All right. Um, does anyone have any questions? Um, we, are we going to take a one or two <laughs> right now because we're getting close to running out of time. I don't know. Let's see the question. I know. Um, so, uh, and we got some comments from uh, Juan Demita. This composition yeah. is really good. It sounds very emotional. So it's emotional. Okay. Uh, yeah. See, he asked a question uh, when I perform stair material yeah. live. How much of it rehearsed and improvised? Um, so that that's a great question. Um, and that's their element that differentiates the stuff that's on this new CD versus the uh, the stuff that's done under the name Stayer. Uh, the Stayer stuff lives inside a a framework. It's got a script, but it's improvisational. If that makes sense, what I'll do is um, I kind of. You know, like I was talking about, you know, when I do like the graphic design things, I'll put stuff up on the note board and, you know, start to kind of have, Move you know, these, this style. Yeah. Um, when I do stayer, it is 100% live. There's nothing coming from backing tracks. There's no DAW. There's no laptop. Um, it is, you know, there are sequencers, but it's like, you know, it's like the sequencer over on the the modular or it's the sequencer that's built into uh you know something like the poly six um which is really even a sequencer as much as it is an arpeggiator um or i'll use the sequencer in the the chord mini log or something like that and it's way more based on feel and that's something i picked up um when my music started getting played by chuck van zyle on Star's End Radio, which is a, a radio show here in Philadelphia that's been on the air for something like 41 years. Um, I really looked to Chuck as a mentor um, for, for the way that uh, he and other people in the Berlin School, uh, Ian Boddy, um, Jason Sloan, uh, Bernhard Vost Heinrich, um, Klaus Schulze, you know, they all do these shows where it's very improvisational, you know, but it's got sort of a roadmap. Um, improvisation, as I understand it, um, from a, you know, from a classical perspective is not just walk up to an instrument and go, eh, what am I going to play? I don't know. You know, uh, it's more about, you know, like a jazz sort of feeling where you have charts and you kind of stay within this framework. You play within uh, the and, structure. Right. And especially with the concept of space music, you know, I make what is termed space music and that's always been something that I took to heart in terms of feeling, especially because a lot of those compositions center around drones and things like that that are coming from the modular. Um, the fact that the modular is semi-random and it's creating these things that have period to them but aren't necessarily looping, they're not repetitive, they're, but they are semi-cyclical. Uh, listening 
just like I'm, I would if I was in a jazz combo and I'm listening to the other musicians for cues where I might play a fill or you know, look to other players for a key change or something like that or a tempo change. Um, I'm listening to the other players, which are all my instruments. I'm listening mm -hmm. to cues where, okay, it sounds like this one part's going to modulate softer. So then maybe I can play this little two or three note, uh, you know, a passage with the piano or something like that. So Juan, um, that's something that is, um, that's something that I hold very important to those performances. Like when I play at uh, the gatherings or, um, you know, event horizon or any of those things that I've done is to make sure that even despite the fact that it's sort of, uh, even with Pretty Hate Machine, you know, we are playing live, you know what I mean? There is a backing track there, but we've all got, you know, the, the sounds I'm playing on those keys is very much live, that there's that element of, oh God, you know, like that, that element of danger of this could all go a little bit sideways. And that even happened um, when I did uh, the on-air performance of the stuff that ended up on telemetry. Um, you know, uh, it was one of the things that I, I kind of had a, Okay, someone else feels this besides me. When I, I saw Suzanne Chiani speak at Musician uh, Machines and Music up in Brooklyn a few years ago, she was talking about how it was always a bit pulse pounding to perform with her bukla because if something drifted out of tune, it was suddenly like, what's going to happen now? Um, but that happened. You know what I mean? I, I was set up in a radio studio and the air conditioning kicked on. So everything that was tuned and in place uh, at the time that, you know, before we went on air, when I turned up, you know, and, and we're talking, this is an hour long performance of which I was going into like the third movement of. So we're talking 40 minutes in, I turn up the volume on this one sequencer part that's been running in the background the whole time. And I go to make it live and I hear it and it's like, you know, it's a couple cents out you know, and I'm like, okay, I don't know whether it's flat or if it's sharp and this could affect, you know, a couple of things. And, oh, that's also affecting the speed of the LFO that's driving the clock for the whole thing. Now I'm, you know, I'm, 20 BPM too fast. And that's going to affect how that, you know, I've got an analog delay pedal that's not clock sync. It's just, you know, you dial it up and it's, that's, a, so, um, it certainly gets a bit, um, it gets stressful, but it's fun. You know what I mean? At the end of it, you know, I, I can honestly look at myself in the mirror and look at the people in the audience and be like, no, I mean, this is, this is live electronic music. And, uh, you know, and it's not what a lot of the, the detractors of this genre would call, fake you know i'm not just hitting one button and oh magically this all happens thank you and thank you juan we have one more question uh this is from durham um are there any rare vintage synths you've always wanted to use or own absolutely um i think um I, there, there's two. There's two that i can immediately fire off the top of my head one of which would be an arp 2600 um i have always wanted to have one and I kind of, I, I'm quietly, you know, if, you, if we pan back over here, we look at next to this uh, rack here, we've got this little record case that I've got my little plasma ball sitting on. But that's that's low-key reserved for the day that a 2600 magically falls into my hands. <laughs> uh, and then there will be a place for it. And when Korg did their reissue of it, I was, you know, I was like, yeah, I, I, I might want to pop the pop the uh pop the, the parachute on that one and, and and finance it and call up my my sweetwater guy or or whatever and then put that on a put that on a five-year payment plan but alas those things went you know pretty much the moment they were announced and so mm -hmm. i didn't get a chance to get at it um but it that, that's that's definitely on, on the on the short list the other one would be an oberheim expander actually i've got three because there's the oberheim expander um or the OB-12, uh, not the OB-12, sorry, the, the OB-12 was not so good, the Matrix-12. Um, Matrix-12 or the Expander, either one, uh, I would take that because those are both monsters. Uh, and then the other one would be a Sequential Circuits Profit VS hmm. uh, because that one is just, um, I listened to a lot of the soundtrack work that John Carpenter did. And you can hear Prophet VS all over that. He's like a very big sequential guy. So he's got Prophet 5 and Prophet VS all over stuff like Escape from New York, Big Trouble in Little China, Halloween, uh, The Thing, um, um, Prince of Darkness, you know, like all those things. That, that's, I would love a VS, but they're expensive and rare and you don't often find them. So 
if anybody wants to wants to gift me one, uh, I will I will definitely give your give your photo an entire page <laughs> in the liner notes of my next release. <laughs> All right, great. Well, um, on a, we hopefully are getting a studio together where you will be able to play uh, vintage ARPs. Um, so we want to make this available to the greater public. And I do want to actually use this as a, uh, an unplanned but opportunistic mention that this is a not-for-profit. Uh, Eleanor R. Perlman Foundation is a not-for-profit. And we're working on two projects right now. Um, one is we're working on a recording studio that will be located in Boston. Uh, where we're trying to amass a collection of ARP synthesizers, uh, the rare ones, um, that uh, will have a pro programs where people can come in and record um, at affordable prices and also have an uh, artist in residency where someone can apply to work with uh, an artist uh, and, and hopefully uh, come up with some great stuff. And we're also working on a scholarship for a Berkeley College of Music we're feeling that now is the time where organizations really need to uh, focus on education. Um, educational institutions have suffered a lot with the crisis, and so have students and incomes that would provide an education for students. So we're working in that realm. Um, at the end of the video, there will be a little place to uh uh, don a little address to donate if you are into that. Um, donate. 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 <laughs> okay. Um, I want to end. Uh, we're going to have uh, one um, sh a little bit of a short piece um, as we leave. And this is the actually the first piece on your CD, which is real short. Um, this is called Fundamental Assumptions. And... Um, at that point, uh, we'll be ending the broadcast. So I just wanted to thank you again, really, for your time, your generosity of spirit. Um, you've been uh, a real great support, and I, I love going to your page and seeing your post, by the way. Thank you. <laughs> um, please check out his page. Ch please check out his Bandcamp uh, page. Uh, there's You can see Stare and Ian Stare, which has the, the newest CD. All right. And um, thank you again, everyone, and we will see you next week. All right.